Welcome, friends. Welcome, we welcome, here. welcome to another Field Trip Friday. I'm Jenna. And I'm Steve. And we're in different places today. <laughs> Why you can see our faces. Yes, uh, you can see our faces without masks. It's so great to have you all again. Um, this week, I am super excited because we brought it back to the museum and we are going to go visit uh, the farmyard with Dr. Kennedy, one of the, the great team who takes care of our animals at the museum. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Kennedy. Oh, thank you guys for having me. And I'm looking forward to sharing uh, this trip out to the farmyard with all of our attendees today. Us too, us too, I'm super excited. Each Friday, we're hosted by a different DPS classroom. And this week we have Miss Gazy's uh, third grade class uh, from Southwest Elementary, woohoo! And um, from Spring Valley Elementary, we have Miss Holloway's fourth grade class. I am so excited that you all are here today. All right, Steve, do you wanna start? Yeah, I just wanted to show the, uh, here's, here's a photo of Southwest. Yay, Southwest, thanks for being Southwest, here. Southwest, Southwest. And then I also wanted to show Spring Valley. There you are. Oh, I was, hold on. Southwest Spring Valley. So happy you all are here. Remember you all can um, uh, ask some questions in the chat. Uh, as we're watching the video. Um, and uh, we'll also ask uh, Ms. Gazy and uh, Ms. Holloway to answer some of your questions out loud for Dr. Kennedy and Steve and our, uh, um, Steve ourselves um, about our experience. Ready to get started, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, apologies for the technical difficulties there with the school photos, but uh, thank you both for being here. <laughs> All righty, we will get going. Woo. Mm -hmm. Here we go. I'm Jenna. And I'm Steve. Welcome back to another Field Trip Friday. Where are we today, Steve? Today, we're going to the farmyard at the museum. So, uh, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Hi, Dr. Kennedy. Hey. Hey, good morning. Good morning to you. How are you? Yeah, better than the average person. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what you do here at the museum? Yes, uh, I'm the veterinarian for the farm animals out here in the farmyard, so it is my responsibility to help make sure that they have all the health and medical care that they need to have healthy, happy lives. Do you take care of all of the animals in the farm yard? Or? Well, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I'm here, I will look in at all the animals here in the farm yard to make sure that they're all staying fairly healthy. But they have their own pig specialist that takes care of the pigs. And there's an equine specialist that takes care of lightning and his uh, primary health care needs. Cool. So I think we're gonna take a look around too, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's do it. All right.
are here with you, Dr. Kennedy. We are meeting a goat. Uh, which goat is this again? This is Charles. <laughs> Hi, Charles. Hi, Charlie. Hey, Hi, Charlie. How's it going? Wants breakfast so bad. So we won't keep you too long from breakfast, Charlie. Uh, so, Dr. Kennedy, can you tell us a little bit about this animal? Like, what an what kind of animal is it and how you take care of them? Yes, this is Charles. He's a Nigerian dwarf. He's an uh, African breed of uh, goat, which, you know, from their uh, home country, they are considered a dual-purpose animal, meaning that we use them for both, both meat and milk purposes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, of course, here at the museum, <laughs> we use them for pets. So yes. Nice. So just lots of loving and petting. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but Charles is uh, a goat, and he's of the K-Prime um, uh, family, and they are considered true ruminants. True meaning ruminants. Meaning that they have four different parts to their stomachs. They have a rumen, a reticulum, an omasum, and an abomasum. Those are the four true parts to their stomachs, so that when they eat stuff, they digest it and they take it through all four parts of those stomachs in order to turn it into energy uh, that they use for survival. Uh, so they're a little bit different than uh, some other uh, species of animals in that. Yeah. Way. Once they've uh, gone out, they've chewed on food all day out in the pasture, eating the grass, all the grass that they want, then they come back and they lay down and they take their time and they do what we call chew their cud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they regurgitate that food, they pull it back up from that first part of their stomach. That root, what's what the first part of the stomach called? The rumen. The rumen. Yeah, the rumen. Mm -hmm. They pull it back up from the rumen, they chew on it some more, they break it down, they yeah. make it a little more finer so that the other parts of the stomach can digest it a whole lot easier. Nice. I think that's so interesting that digestion in us is basically one way, mm -hmm. but then in ruminants, like uh, Charles here, it can go one way and then back up and then one way again. Right, it's yeah, yeah, that they can kind yeah. of go back and forth and keep that material in their digestive system and in spe specific parts of their digestive yeah. system back and forth, like you said, in different ways. Well, thank you, Dr. Kennedy, and thank you, Charlie. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Charlie. All right, Chuck. Hey, buddy. Are. We've got an alpaca, and so this is Retro. Um, hi, Retro. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi to everybody, Retro. <laughs> He's wiggling that ear, saying hello. Yeah. So um, we just met some goats, but uh, how how is your care for the alpacas different than your care for the goats? Yeah, alpacas are completely different animals than goats, and that's the first thing you need to understand. Uh, goats are what we consider ruminants. Uh, they're true ruminants in that they have four different parts to their stomachs. Alpacas are considered pseudo-ruminants. They only have three different parts to their stomachs. We have C1, C2, and C3. Uh, so those differences make them metabolize and uh, utilize the stuff that they eat for food a little bit differently. In some ways, they're more efficient. Hmm. Fascinating. Do they eat different things than goats? Um, no, not really. They both like grass. But alpacas and goats are what we consider both browsers. They like to eat things up high versus sheep. They like to eat things down low. Like cows and sheep, they'll eat right off the ground. They're grazers. I see. So that's the difference between uh, the way that they like to eat. But they eat the same stuff in general. Interesting. Awesome. Something that I know just from working here at the museum and being familiar with the, the farmyard is that I noticed that the alpacas are kind of a little bit more skittish or sometimes a little bit more afraid of certain things. Um, so does that impact your work with them when, when you are examining them? It does. Alpacas are obviously a lot larger than the goats. <laughs> so uh, with them being a little bit skittish, as you said, or a little bit afraid of certain types of things and the way that people approach them, that can make them a little more dangerous. Uh, they're not going to intentionally try to hurt me or anyone else. But in the efforts that they're making and trying to get away mm -hmm. uh, to protect themselves, uh, they may cause a little bit of harm. So uh, from that standpoint, just by them being a little bit more large uh, than 
uh, the goats, uh, you need to be a little more cautious and more careful. So that's why I put the halter on, and they're used to having halters on, and you can see that retro version here is perfectly happy and content standing here with me restraining her, uh, just holding this halter. Yeah. Now if another person attempts to approach, she may get a little <laughs> bit uh, disturbed and let us know by doing what she's done just right there. They hum when they get uh, a little bit excited or disturbed sometimes uh, to let, let you know that they're a little bit um, upset. So uh, holding them, and as a matter of fact, hugging retro like this is uh, one of the best ways to physically restrain one. That way you have that head, you're holding it close to your body, she's not swinging it around where it's going to hurt her or hurt uh, anyone else. But restraint is the absolute most important thing that we have to do to appropriately work on any animal that we're uh, working with in uh, veterinary medicine. So once we have her nice and comfortably restrained where she's not you're humming and upset right now. She likes being hugged. It's a nice hug there, Retro. <laughs> so give her a nice little hug. Then I can do things like do a physical exam. I have my stethoscope over there. I can check her body out to make sure she doesn't have any areas of injury. I can look at her feet. I can pick her feet up and look at them to see if she needs to have her toenails trimmed or anything of that nature. Uh, we can check her body to make sure she has no uh, like I said, um, your ectoparasites, mm. um, your lice or mange or anything or ticks like that on her body. And do all of the things that I do in a typical veterinary exam, you know, by looking into their eyes and make sure their eyes are looking like they're normal and healthy. Or maybe even checking their teeth. So, um, <laughs> Super. again, all of these are things that are routinely done during our annual health exams. Thanks, Dr. Kennedy. Yeah. And thank you, Retro. And thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Sharon. <laughs>So, Dr. Kennedy, I am super excited to be here in this space with you because we are meeting one of my favorite animals, Dusty. Uh, so, what type of animal is Dusty? Dusty is a bull. Okay, he's a miniature Hereford bull at that. So, he's uh, happy. He's very happy to be here because, under normal circumstances, Dusty would be one of those animals that we'd be using potentially for a steak, a hamburger, or. Uh, one of those human consumption products that folks that eat meat would use. I'm so happy that he is here. Yeah. I'm well, happy too. Us. Yeah. Good question, Steve. Um, so I guess uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about um, the, uh, the ruminant goats. We've talked mm -hmm. a little bit about the pseudo-ruminant alpacas. And so I think you mentioned earlier that cattle are grazers. And so, and, yeah. and, and, and are they true? They're true ruminants, right? They are true ruminants. They have four complete different sec separate sections to their uh, digestive system. So awesome. that makes them uh, true ruminants. Cool. Are there, are there other differences between the way that um, kind of cattle physiology works versus like a particular or a goat. yeah well specifically i'm kind of thinking of the goats like since they're both true ruminants what yeah. are some of the differences between those two within that category yeah one of the big differences that you may or may not have noticed is that as you came into the farmyard uh you saw these uh, little piles of poo mm -hmm. uh, we call those patties uh, cow patties, mm -hmm. and they have much looser stool that their digestive system produces based on the way that it's designed compared to the setup that goats have. Goats produce little tiny pellets, mm -hmm. the same way that alpacas do when they uh, produce uh, their feces right. or their waste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So based on their physiology, based on their size, the anatomy of their digestive systems, uh, their GI content that they produce uh, through feces is quite a bit different. Thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy, and thank you too, Aaron, and thank you, Dusty. Yes. Uh, thank you again so much, Dr. Kennedy, for uh, hanging out with us today. And I have uh, a question that we've been asking all of our friends around the triangle is, uh, what is a moment of curiosity that you've had in your life? Hmm. If I think about it, I'd say one key moment of curiosity that I've had in my life was one that happened when I was growing up and working on a dairy farm uh, that I grew up on in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia that every time an animal would get sick, uh, the cattle in particular, the veterinarian would come, they'd take care of the animals, they'd get better, 
and he'd go away. Well, we had one that didn't get better, mm -hmm. and he left a bunch of medication for me to be the person to continue treating this animal with, and I did so uh, the way that he had instructed. But unfortunately, that animal died. Mm. So that point of curiosity that really stands out to me now, and it did at that time, was you know, why is it that that animal didn't survive after the veterinarian came and did all of those wonderful things that needed to be done to uh, help it the way that the others did? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I actually got into veterinary school and we were having a physiology lecture one day and the physiology instructor had explained that this one particular type of medication, which was the same one that I was using mm. uh, to treat this animal uh, with that was sick, if given too rapidly, it can stop the heart mm. instantly. Well, this medication that I was given, I gave it rapidly, and it stopped the heart of that animal, and it died. Mm. So I learned and understood from that point on the importance of not just you know, how different drugs and medications can have effects on animals, but how you give them. Mm. You know, that route of administration, whether you're given medicine in the vein, whether you're given medicine in you know, the muscle or under the skin, it's very important to make sure that you follow the rules that uh, are uh, licensed by the pharmacists or the pharmacologists to give those medications appropriately. Otherwise, you can do harm. That leads me to our kind of next question, which is um, we like to talk about how we embrace failure, how we use those moments when things don't go the way they do to change our lives or to, 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 to grow and become something, something more, to learn. Yeah. Um, can you share a moment? I mean, that was a good one in itself. But do you have do you have another moment that sh that comes to mind when you when you think about embracing failure, something that that didn't happen as expected for you? Sure. Yeah. And I mean, the, the case that I just mentioned is the perfect example in many ways. Mm -hmm. in that obviously, I was taught and told, all right, this is how you give this medicine, do this, and the animal should get better. But when it doesn't happen, you know, that sends a uh, a thought process into uh, motion that okay uh, was it the medicine was it uh, the your technique or the way that um, I as an individual had administered it and we as humans we need to learn that even sometimes when we do things completely correct the way that we believe that they should be done even the best made efforts are sometimes going to lead in negative results mm -hmm. On that note, I just the example that comes to mind for me as far as embracing failure would fit within this theme of discussion we're having now where during my time in veterinary college, I ended up having loss of life from the two people in my life that were most important to me at that time. Mm -hmm. My mother and my grandmother, those are the two that really uh, raised me and shaped me to be the individual that I am. So during that time, I spent most of my efforts focusing on them and what, what they were going through instead of focusing on my education mm -hmm. and my academics. So I ended up failing a course that took me out of veterinary school and having to come back and repeat that course. Now, as a result of that, I will say that that made me much more focused, much stronger in realizing that again, my grandmother and my mother wanted me to do this. They mm -hmm. wanted me to be successful. So that was my focus from there on. So I turned that negative energy, that negative experience into something that was extremely positive. And so from that standpoint, again, trying to take the things that life gives us and turn those things, whether they're good or bad, into positive things that can that we can learn from. Uh, life is a learning uh, lesson of experiences that we all go through. We all have various journeys, uh, different types of experiences that we encounter. But know that we can make what we want out of those types of uh, experiences as they happen. There are going to be some hard lessons that we all get in life. There are going to be some great lessons that we all get in life. But regardless, those lessons that we get need to be used for something that's positive and beneficial. And that's what I made. Uh, from the two losses of the people that were most inspirational to me to uh, go into veterinary medicine and do the things that I've done uh, happen. So uh, that would be my best lesson and 
our recommendation is you'll try to turn those lemons into lemonade, as we'd say, and uh, make those uh, life experiences uh, happen and be the best and the most that you can uh, as the opportunities present themselves. That's, thank you. Yeah, that's so wonderful. Yes. Thank you for sharing such a personal story with us, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you. Yes, sure. thank you. It was wonderful. And thank you so much for taking us around the farmyard today. Mm -hmm. Glad to. Absolutely. All right. So stay tuned for next week, everyone. Yeah, we'll see you next, next Friday for our next Field Trip Friday. That was such a great video. Yeah. Thank you again, Dr. Kennedy, for sharing all of your wonderful knowledge and your personal stories. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we were having a very active chat uh, during the video. Uh, so Ms. Gacy and Ms. Holloway, would you like to read out loud some of your students' questions? Yes, well, um, and all my students' questions were answered. Um, the one about the... Um, um, sorry, what about, um, do you have to go to college? That was answered. And, um, the one also about the, uh, what, 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 what do the donkeys actually eat? That was answered as well. So, yeah. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, uh, just, uh, answering those questions again for all of our, uh, viewers on YouTube. To, so, so those sound like two particularly awesome questions. Um, the, the first one was that, uh, do you mind just saying that question out loud, Ms. Holloway? How, how did it, was it, uh, do you need to go to college to be a veterinarian? Yeah, do you have to go to college to be a veterinarian? Yes. Cool. And so Dr. Kennedy, would you, would you mind answering sure. that question? Yes, and absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you must first, uh, yes, we do have some veterinary students that get into veterinary uh, college without having to go through their uh, four years of undergraduate training first, but we do have a set of courses that every veterinary student must take in order to qualify to get admitted into veterinary college. So veterinary school is what we consider professional school. Uh, it happens after you do undergraduate training. So most students go to four years of undergraduate college first, and then they apply to get into professional school uh, which trains them, them to become a doctor of veterinary medicine. Thank you. And then the other question um, I believe you, you mentioned was, was about uh, uh, lightening our donkey in the farmyard's uh, food. Yes, yes, yes. Want to know what exactly what they eat. That's awesome. Yeah, the main thing that donkeys eat is grass. So when the grass is not there like now, when it's starting to die off, what most people will do is farmers will... Uh, harvest the grass, they will cut it down, they will uh, let it go dry, and then they will bale it up into what we call hay. And that hay is what they eat later in the wintertime when the grass isn't growing. So it's just dried grass uh, that we call hay that we feed the donkeys, we feed the uh, goats hay, the alpacas eat hay, and so do the cows. So hay is good stuff for them. Uh, but they also like to have treats sometime. And the treats come in the form of donkey chow. Donkey chow is uh, like corn and cereal and things like you eat for breakfast that has sometimes some molasses that makes it really, really sweet. So it gives them extra energy so that they can grow and uh, get health, stay healthy and uh, not be hungry during those cold winter days and nights. Hey, one more question. So would you say they're herbivores? Yes. They are primarily herbivores. Mm -hmm. They don't eat anything uh, anything that is uh, similar to the types of uh, meats that we eat. They're not um, carnivores. Um, Thank you. From my students, um, they wanted to know if the cows were used for milking and what is the process to assess if an animal is sick? Great questions. Uh, well, cows are used for milking, and the term cow usually means a female, a uh, female of the bovine species. But the two that you saw in the picture were both actually boys, and the boys are what we call bulls. So bulls aren't used for milking. The bulls are usually used uh, to help make babies so that we can get more cows that if people do want to have animals that they milk or eat, 
you know, for those that don't eat cows, and there are a lot of cultures uh, that don't believe in eating cows. So, um, but for those that do, that's what uh, we use the bulls for, mainly for uh, reproduction and making more um, offspring and also for their meat purposes. And the girls are again, the cows that we use, especially the dairy cows are the ones that we use to make milk. But those two that we saw, uh, the Herefords, the miniature Herefords are beef cattle and they're mainly used for making meat. And then what was your, what was your other question, Miss Gacy? They wanted to know the process. I guess if an animal is sick and you're trying to determine what the problem is, what is the process for screening that animal? Yeah, good question there too. And that one comes into play where the animal keepers, the guys that are there at the museum that are looking in at them every day whenever they notice anything that's odd happening. And something odd might mean that just all of a sudden they decide not to eat their food that day. So maybe they have a stomach ache or, and that has happened occasionally. So uh, when the animal does not do the things that they normally do every day, just like us, you know, say if you get out of bed and in one morning you say, I don't wanna eat breakfast, I have a tummy ache, that's why I don't wanna eat. The same things happen in the animals. So that's when they call me, they call the veterinarian and say, something's not right today. Um, you know, uh, Lightning didn't eat his breakfast, so we need to have him checked out, see why he didn't eat his breakfast. Or if they're you know, not getting up, not walking around because again, they may have sore feet or legs, maybe they exercise too much the day before. It could be simple things that will make them just not feel well, but they will show usually uh, something different in their behavior that indicates that they're not feeling well. And that's when uh, they, again, the animal keepers that or that know their animals very well will call the veterinarian to come and check them out. I see a question in there, the donkeys play fetch. Yes, Lightning does play fetch. He loves playing. Yeah, I, at the very first time I ever met uh, Lightning, in fact, the very first time I ever visited the museum, I went into the farmyard and donkey, uh, donkey Lightning, our donkey, had his, <laughs> had, had this big, ball kind of like tug toy thing that he was carrying around in his mouth. And I went over to just see what he was doing with it. And he brought it over and he get, let me hold it. And then he like, and I threw it, he grabbed it and brought it back. And we did that a few times. I was just like, this is an incredible experience. It just blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about if lightning runs around and then usually I, I've only ever seen lightning run <laughs> when he's playing fetch. Definitely not when he's going for his walks. He, he, he's a very low key donkey. Yeah. Um, but thank you all so much for answering these wonderful questions. Thank you, Miss Gazy and Miss Holloway and your beautiful students in the chat for uh, having fun with me in the chat and asking their wonderful questions. Thank you again so, so, so much, uh, Dr. Kennedy, for being with us today and hanging out with us in the farmyard and also, you know, treating all of our animals or some of our animals at the museum. And shout out to uh, Sherry and the animal care team for letting us uh, kind of mess up your schedule uh, when we were out there kind of in your way. Um, but I really appreciate everyone that was involved um, in this video. Uh, Willow and Linda, who are our DPS science specialists, uh, thank you again so much um, for giving us this opportunity today. And thank you, Steve, for being a wonderful host. Well, thank you, Jenna. Um, I'd like to, uh, to, to shout out one more time, uh, Southwest and Spring Valley. Thanks again, y'all. And I want to give you a sneak preview of uh, next week. So next week, we're going to be visiting Cacao Canela, which is cocoa cinnamon. Um, and we're going to, to take the journey of uh, coffee from, from plant to cup. And uh, we'll also get to try some of their delicious chocolate and some of their churros. And um, I just want to say nos vemos. Um, oh. uh, y hasta la próxima, amigos. So get your Spanish ears thinking. Um, and also um, the next time you eat something delicious, really pay attention to what that tastes like. What's that like? Really, really focus in. And we'll talk more about that next week. See you there, friends. See you next Friday. Bye everyone. Adios, everyone. Have a good weekend. <laughs>